Life on the Mississippi, Chapter 29 Chapter 29. A few specimen bricks. We passed through the Plum Point region, turned Craig Head's Point, and glided unchallenged by what was once the formidable Fort Pillow, memorable because of the massacre perpetrated there during the war. Massacres are sprinkled with some frequency through the histories of several Christian nations, but this is almost the only one that can be found in American history. Perhaps it is the only one which rises to a size correspondent to that huge and somber title. We have the Boston Massacre, where two or three people were killed. But we must bunch Anglo-Saxon history together to find the fellow to the Fort Pillow tragedy. And doubtless even then we must travel back to the days and the performances of Coeur de Lion, that fine hero, before we accomplish it. More of the river's freaks. In times past, the channel used to strike above Island 37, by Brandywine Bar, and down towards Island 39. Afterward, changed its course and went from Brandywine down through Vogelman's chute in the Devil's Elbow, to Island 39 part of this course reversing the old order. The river running up four or five miles, instead of down, and cutting off, throughout, some fifteen miles of distance. This in 1876. All that region is now called Centennial Island. There is a tradition that Island 37 was one of the principal abiding places of the once celebrated Murals Gang. This was a colossal combination of robbers, horse thieves, negro stealers, and counterfeiters, engaged in business along the river some 50 or 60 years ago. While our journey across the country towards St. Louis was in progress we had had no end of Jesse James and his stirring history. For he had just been assassinated by an agent of the governor of Missouri, and was in consequence occupying a good deal of space in the newspapers. Cheap histories of him were for sale by train boys. According to these, he was the most marvelous creature of his kind that had ever existed. It was a mistake. Murel was his equal in boldness, in pluck, in rapacity. In cruelty, brutality, heartlessness, treachery, and in general and comprehensive vileness and shamelessness, and very much his superior in some larger aspects. James was a retail rascal. Murel, wholesale. James's modest genius dreamed of no loftier flight than the planning of raids upon cars, coaches, and country banks. Murel projected Negro insurrections and the capture of New Orleans, and furthermore, on occasion, this Murel could go into a pulpit and edify the congregation. What are James and his half-dozen vulgar rascals compared with this stately old-time criminal, with his sermons, his meditated insurrections and city captures, and his majestic following of ten hundred men, sworn to do his evil will? Here is a paragraph or two concerning this big operator, from a now-forgotten book which was published half a century ago. He appears to have been a most dexterous as well as consummate villain. When he travelled, his usual disguise was that of an itinerant preacher. And it is said that his discourses were very soul-moving. Interesting the hearers so much that they forgot to look after their horses, which were carried away by his confederates while he was preaching. But the stealing of horses in one state, and selling them in another, was but a small portion of their business. The most lucrative was the enticing slaves to run away from their masters, that they might sell them in another quarter. This was arranged as follows. They would tell a negro that if he would run away from his master, and allow them to sell him, he should receive a portion of the money paid for him, and that upon his return to them a second time they would send him to a free state, where he would be safe. The poor wretches complied with this request, hoping to obtain money and freedom, they would be sold to another master, and run away again, to their employers. Sometimes they would be sold in this manner three or four times, until they had realized three or four thousand dollars by them. But as, after this, there was fear of detection, the usual custom was to get rid of the only witness that could be produced against them, which was the Negro himself, by murdering him, and throwing his body into the Mississippi. Even if it was established that they had stolen a Negro, before he was murdered, they were always prepared to evade punishment. For they concealed the negro who had run away, until he was advertised, and a reward offered to any man who would catch him. An advertisement of this kind warrants the person to take the property, if found. And then the negro becomes a property in trust, when, therefore, they sold the negro, it only became a breach of trust, not stealing. And for a breach of trust, the owner of the property can only have redress by a civil action, which was useless, as the damages were never paid. 
It may be inquired, how it was that Murrell escaped lynch law under such circumstances this will be easily understood when it is stated that he had more than a thousand sworn Confederates, all ready at a moment's notice to support any of the gang who might be in trouble. The names of all the principal Confederates of Murrell were obtained from himself, in a manner which I shall presently explain. The gang was composed of two classes, the heads or council, as they were called, who planned and concerted, but seldom acted, they amounted to about 400. The other class were the active agents, and were termed strikers, and amounted to about 650. These were the tools in the hands of the others. They ran all the risk, and received but a small portion of the money. They were in the power of the leaders of the gang, who would sacrifice them at any time by handing them over to justice, or sinking their bodies in the Mississippi. The general rendezvous of this gang of miscreants was on the Arkansas side of the river, where they concealed their negroes in the morasses and cane breaks. The depredations of this extensive combination were severely felt. But so well were the plans arranged, that although Murrell, who was always active, was everywhere suspected, there was no proof to be obtained. It so happened, however, that a young man of the name of Stuart, who was looking after two slaves which Murrell had decoyed away, fell in with him and obtained his confidence, took the oath, and was admitted into the gang as one of the general council. By this means all was discovered. For Stuart turned traitor, although he had taken the oath, and having obtained every information, exposed the whole concern, the names of all the parties, and finally succeeded in bringing home sufficient evidence against Murrell, to procure his conviction and sentence to the penitentiary Murrell was sentenced to fourteen years imprisonment. So many people who were supposed to be honest, and bore a respectable name in the different states, were found to be among the list of the Grand Council as published by Stuart, that every attempt was made to throw discredit upon his assertions. His character was vilified, and more than one attempt was made to assassinate him. He was obliged to quit the southern states in consequence. It is, however, now well ascertained to have been all true, and although some blame Mr. Stewart for having violated his oath, they no longer attempt to deny that his revelations were correct. I will quote one or two portions of Murrell's confessions to Mr. Stewart, made to him when they were journeying together. I ought to have observed, that the ultimate intentions of Murrell and his associates were, by his own account, on a very extended scale. Having no less an object in view than raising the blacks against the whites, taking possession of, and plundering New Orleans, and making themselves possessors of the territory. The following are a few extracts. I collected all my friends about New Orleans at one of our friends' houses in that place, and we Saturday in council three days before we got all our plans to our notion. We then determined to undertake the rebellion at every hazard, and make as many friends as we could for that purpose. Every man's business being assigned him, I started to Natchez on foot, having sold my horse in New Orleans, with the intention of stealing another after I started. I walked four days, and no opportunity offered for me to get a horse. The fifth day, about twelve, I had become tired, and stopped at a creek to get some water and rest a little. While I was sitting on a log, looking down the road the way that I had come, a man came in sight riding on a good-looking horse. The very moment I saw him, I was determined to have his horse, if he was in the garb of a traveller. He rode up, and I saw from his equipage that he was a traveller. I arose and drew an elegant rifle pistol on him and ordered him to dismount. He did so, and I took his horse by the bridle and pointed down the creek, and ordered him to walk before me. He went a few hundred yards and stopped. I hitched his horse, and then made him undress himself, all to his shirt and drawers, and ordered him to turn his back to me. He said, if you are determined to kill me, let me have time to pray before I die, I told him I had no time to hear him pray. He turned around and dropped on his knees, and I shot him through the back of the head. I ripped open his belly and took out his entrails, and sunk him in the creek. I then searched his pockets, and found $400.37, and a number of papers that I did not take time to examine. I sunk the pocketbook and papers and his hat, in the creek. His boots were brand new, and fitted me genteely, and I put them on and sunk my old shoes in the creek, to atone for them. I rolled up his clothes and put them into his portmanteau, as they were brand new cloth of the best quality. I mounted as fine a horse as ever I straddled, and directed my course for Natchez in much better style than I had been for the last five days. Myself and a fellow by the name of Crenshaw gathered four good horses and started for Georgia. 
We got in company with a young South Carolinian just before we got to Cumberland Mountain, and Crenshaw soon knew all about his business. He had been to Tennessee to buy a drove of hogs, but when he got there pork was dearer than he calculated, and he declined purchasing. We concluded he was a prize. Crenshaw winked at me. I understood his idea. Crenshaw had traveled the road before, but I never had. We had traveled several miles on the mountain, when he passed near a great precipice. Just before we passed it Crenshaw asked me for my whip, which had a pound of lead in the butt. I handed it to him, and he rode up by the side of the South Carolinian, and gave him a blow on the side of the head and tumbled him from his horse, we lit from our horses and fingered his pockets. We got $1,262. Crenshaw said he knew a place to hide him, and he gathered him under his arms, and I by his feet, and conveyed him to a deep crevice in the brow of the precipice, and tumbled him into it, and he went out of sight. We then tumbled in his saddle, and took his horse with us, which was worth $200. We were detained a few days, and during that time our friend went to a little village in the neighborhood and saw the Negro advertised, a Negro in our possession, and a description of the two men of whom he had been purchased, and giving his suspicions of the men. It was rather squally times, but any port in a storm, we took the Negro that night on the bank of a creek which runs by the farm of our friend, and Crenshaw shot him through the head. We took out his entrails and sunk him in the creek. He had sold the other Negro the third time on Arkansas River for upwards of $500. And then stole him and delivered him into the hand of his friend, who conducted him to a swamp, and veiled the tragic scene, and got the last gleanings and sacred pledge of secrecy. As a game of that kind will not do unless it ends in a mystery to all but the fraternity. He sold the Negro, first and last, for nearly $2,000, and then put him forever out of the reach of all pursuers, and they can never graze him unless they can find the Negro. And that they cannot do, for his carcass has fed many a tortoise and catfish before this time, and the frogs have sung this many a long day to the silent repose of his skeleton. We were approaching Memphis, in front of which city, and witnessed by its people, was fought the most famous of the river battles of the Civil War. Two men whom I had served under, in my river days, took part in that fight. Mr. Bixby, head pilot of the Union fleet, and Montgomery, commodore of the Confederate fleet. Both saw a great deal of active service during the war, and achieved high reputations for pluck and capacity. As we neared Memphis, we began to cast about for an excuse to stay with the gold dust to the end of her course Vicksburg. We were so pleasantly situated, that we did not wish to make a change. I had an errand of considerable importance to do at Napoleon, Arkansas, but perhaps I could manage it without quitting the gold dust, I said as much, so we decided to stick to present quarters. The boat was to tarry at Memphis till ten the next morning. It is a beautiful city, nobly situated on a commanding bluff overlooking the river. The streets are straight and spacious, though not paved in a way to incite distempered admiration. No, the admiration must be reserved for the town sewerage system, which is called perfect. A recent reform, however, for it was just the other way, up to a few years ago a reform resulting from the lesson taught by a desolating visitation of the yellow fever. In those awful days the people were swept off by hundreds, by thousands. And so great was the reduction caused by flight and by death together, that the population was diminished three-fourths, and so remained for a time. Business stood nearly still, and the streets bore an empty Sunday aspect. Here is a picture of Memphis, at that disastrous time, drawn by a German tourist who seems to have been an eyewitness of the scenes which he describes. It is from Chapter 7, of his book, just published, in Leipzig, Mississippi Farten, von Ernst von hess Warteg. In August the yellow fever had reached its extremist height. Daily, hundreds fell a sacrifice to the terrible epidemic. The city was become a mighty graveyard, two-thirds of the population had deserted the place, and only the poor, the aged and the sick, remained behind, a sure prey for the insidious enemy. The houses were closed, little lamps burned in front of many a sign that here death had entered. Often, several lay dead in a single house, from the windows hung black crepe. The stores were shut up, for their owners were gone away or dead. Fearful evil. In the briefest space it struck down and swept away even the most vigorous victim. A slight indisposition, then an hour of fever, then the hideous delirium, then the yellow death. On the street corners, and in the squares, lay sick men, suddenly overtaken by the disease, and even corpses, distorted and rigid. 
Food failed. Meat spoiled in a few hours in the fetid and pestiferous air, and turned black. Fearful clamors issue from many houses. Then after a season they cease, and all is still. Noble, self-sacrificing men come with the coffin, nail it up, and carry it away, to the graveyard. In the night stillness reigns. Only the physicians and the hearses hurry through the streets. And out of the distance, at intervals, comes the muffled thunder of the railway train, which with the speed of the wind, and as if hunted by furies, flies by the pest-ridden city without halting. But there is life enough there now. The population exceeds 40,000 and is augmenting, and trade is in a flourishing condition. We drove about the city. Visited the park and the sociable horde of squirrels there. Saw the fine residences, rose-clad and in other ways enticing to the eye, and got a good breakfast at the hotel. A thriving place is the Good Samaritan City of the Mississippi, has a great wholesale jobbing trade, foundries, machine shops, and manufactories of wagons, carriages, and cotton seed oil. And is shortly to have cotton mills and elevators. Her cotton receipts reached 500,000 bales last year an increase of 60,000 over the year before. Out from her healthy commercial heart issue five trunk lines of railway. And a sixth is being added. This is a very different Memphis from the one which the vanished and unremembered procession of foreign tourists used to put into their books long time ago. In the days of the now forgotten but once renowned and vigorously hated Miss Trollip, Memphis seems to have consisted mainly of one long street of log houses, with some outlying cabins sprinkled around rearward toward the woods. And now and then a pig, and no end of mud. That was fifty-five years ago. She stopped at the hotel. Plainly it was not the one which gave us our breakfast. She says. The table was laid for fifty persons, and was nearly full. They ate in perfect silence, and with such astonishing rapidity that their dinner was over literally before ours was begun. The only sounds heard were those produced by the knives and forks, with the unceasing chorus of coughing, etc. Coughing, etc. The, etc. stands for an unpleasant word there, a word which she does not always charitably cover up, but sometimes prints. You will find it in the following description of a steamboat dinner which she ate in company with a lot of aristocratic planters. Wealthy, well-born, ignorant swells they were, tinseled with the usual harmless military and judicial titles of that old day of cheap shams and windy pretense. The total want of all the usual courtesies of the table, the voracious rapidity with which the viands were seized and devoured, the strange uncouth phrases and pronunciation. The loathsome spitting, from the contamination of which it was absolutely impossible to protect our dresses. The frightful manner of feeding with their knives, till the whole blade seemed to enter into the mouth. And the still more frightful manner of cleaning the teeth afterward with a pocket knife, soon forced us to feel that we were not surrounded by the generals, colonels, and majors of the old world. And that the dinner hour was to be anything rather than an hour of enjoyment.